Uh, now, let me talk a little bit of constitution because unless I talk about constitution, women rights, uh, human rights, it doesn't make much sense. So the constitution of India provides ample space for reforms based on democratic principles of human liberty and dignity. So I was talking about humanity, humanity, and humanity means that you know humans are treated as I mean human is, human being is treated as rational free being, which is what it is human dignity. Uh, so uh, and of course uh, Immanuel Kant is one of the uh, the founder uh, founder uh, of uh, all these notions actually, uh, uh, German philosopher uh, who talks about uh, for the first time of human dignity and human liberty and rationality. So uh, these are the basic foundations of uh, uh, democratic system, democratic liberal system. And um, uh, and actually all these notions of human rights and stuff, they are coming from there. So uh, and um, in that, and of course, uh, as we have said, that uh, Ambedkar had uh, worked on constitution who himself was very much influenced by uh, the modern concept of uh, 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 democracy, uh, modern uh, concept of uh, uh, democracy and uh, and uh, the British system was a student of John Dewey and who worked on constitution. So in, in that sense, uh, that our constitution actually is the most right-based constitution in the world. Now, this I'm saying very, uh, very consciously, uh, because uh, if you look at the, I mean, if you really look at the constitution of the rest of the world, uh, you'll find that you know, we do not have so much uh, uh, right-based constitution as India. So it was heavily influenced by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights guarantees the fundamental principles of human rights. The Constitution of India guarantees to all Indian women equality under Article 14. So under Article 14, women uh, are granted Indian, uh, Indian women are granted equality. Uh, number of, uh, uh, no discrimination by state. Uh, this is also uh, granted. This is by Article 15.1. Equality of opportunity, Article 16. Equal pay for equal work, Article 39D and Article 42. Political rights such as women reservation in panchayats. So this is through the Article 42. It is true that Indian Constitution provides a solid for foundation for equality, except in terms of providing reservation clause 3 of Article 15. Article 46 says providing educational and economic interest of the weaker section of the society in getting government jobs for section of people who have been marginalized and are called schedule caste and schedule tribes as they belong to the lower caste which is unique due to the social and cultural conditions of India. So as you can see that these are uh, uh, you know uh, very important uh, changes which we have uh, articles which very important article clause which we have for uh, uh, sort of uh, providing the, the opportunities for women. Uh, some important changes as human rights acts are passed, scheduled, uh, scheduled caste and scheduled tribe reservations at all levels under preservation of atrocities act in 1989. One third seat to women reservation in panchayats, uh, which is local council in 1992. Human rights commission is established in 1993, which is protection of human rights act right to food in 2001, right to information in 2005, National Rural Employment Guarantee Act in 2005, and National Commission for Women in 1990. So as we can see that these are the constitutional uh, kind of opportunities for women, uh, uh, and that can be claimed as under women rights. It is important to note that the concept, a uh, concern of gender justice and women rights has also been extremely important in India in Indian constitution right from independence. While examining how dharma is practiced, now that's the question we were raising, that how dharma is practiced. I mean, of course, we talked about the ideal conditions uh, and as a, as, a, uh, as a holding principle, but how it is practiced in Indian society as part of gender ju justice, one finds a paradox. Now, this is exactly what I'm trying to draw your attention to. 
one finds a paradox between an urge to change and accept Western progressive and democratic values, and yet this change has to be rooted in the past glory of Indian society. So this is the paradox which every woman is facing even today. That, I mean, we are, we are having this progressive democratic values of rights uh, uh, and, you know, uh, of liberty, of freedom and obligation, etc., obligation towards oneself and also uh, being human. So on the one hand, we realize that these are the things and especially when women are educated, uh, they can question the things and they can argumentatively think the thing. But at the same time, the, the, the rootedness, the past glory of Indian society also uh, uh, we, we find as part of the, because the system, social system in which the child, girl child is born and brought up is not really changed much. Now this paradox influences to a large extent the way of women questions are developed and we find two conflicting images of women in India. One is Devi, which is goddess, and another is Dasi, which is servant. At home, in everyday life, she is servant in the sense that she has to serve everybody, every family member, and she has to look after everybody. And on the other hand, if she is not a uh, servant, then she is actually worshipped in the temple uh, as a deity. She is a god goddess, Madhuga, Kali, Lakshmi, Saraswati, etc. But there is nothing between, in between. She is not a human being. She is not treated as a human being with blood and, uh, uh, and her choices and with her uh, own preference. But it is difficult for the middle class educated working women to be either of the two. She wants some space to be treated as human being, a dignified person who would pro who would have power to decide to be. She just wants to, what she wants to be, what she wants to do. This is what she, she, she needs to have the opportunity to decide and also to do. So to be and to do, that's exactly is the, the, the power of to be and to do. That power is perhaps is not given to the women. Very few people, very few women are fortunate who have this. So for this, she has to go through constantly a struggle. And almost every woman, every girl child has to constantly face a struggle, often very difficult. Women in India have to negotiate freedom and dignity at almost every moment at every stage. The status of women has been focus of attention in India for five, uh, five decades as we have said to a certain extent, uh, we discussed already, uh, uh, or so. The traditional role of women as mother and nurturer is a social construct. So the girl has to be a, a, a nurturer and she has to be a mother. I mean, even the small girl of three or four years, she has to look after her younger brother and sisters. So she's a mother right from her birth almost. And a nurturer is a social... Now, this is actually how the society has constructed her. So, uh, the mother and nurturer, this role is actually a social construct and it needs to be re reviewed. This has been instant, ins insisted by the feminist. The women of the family binds everyone, looks after every member of the family, provides care, solves money problems in crisis, but what does she get in return? Does she have any right to demand care for herself? Now, where is the right? What kind of right we are talking about? What kind of, I mean, within her own family, within her own, I mean, within her own family, which actually provides us the safest place, mother and father and sister and brothers, mothers, grandfathers, etc. So what kind of right does he have? What, what kind of, uh, 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 treat, uh, treatment uh, she actually gets in return. Does she have any right to demand care for herself? Does she have a right to dignified living within her family? Does she get the due respect, love and affection in return from her family members and from the society as an ideal wife of the house as we call Patni or Gravadu? She is not supposed to raise any voice and has to submit to everything. She has to no rights, no dignity, no choice of her own. 
Many NGOs empowerment programs by the government, social work departments through extension programs and forming self-help groups are trying to help women in making them aware of these problems. I myself was involved in number of village programs in self-help groups. But do women exercise the rights provided to them by the law? How many women know that they can approach uh, uh, if there's a domestic violence? How many people, how many women know? And how many of women, even if they know, approach uh, for uh, such kind of help? So creating awareness of laws and making constant amendments law is surely a positive aspect. But do we have any supportive social system which is conducive to the women who choose to exercise their rights? So first of all, women don't choose to write, uh, to exercise the right. And even if we, they choose to exercise the right, they do not get any support from the system, not even the police uh, 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 officers who are actually supposed to be protective. Even the people who are working in public offices are supposed to help women often do not extend the favorable environment so that women can exercise their rights. The situation in cities and villages is more or less the same. So it's not that the situation is better than uh, uh, better in village uh, in cities and uh, worse in villages. It's almost the same. The role of society and its obligations is of fundamental importance. In a way, social pressure is visible. The attitudinal change is much easier. And if the rights of women are recognized as valid and some obligations towards betterment for status of women are recognized by the society at large, the change would be faster. So if the society accepts it, that uh, the, the, the rights of the women are recognized and they uh, provide the supporting system, then the change would be faster. Cities are more individualistic. So if the change actually happens, uh, the change will have, will have to come from the villages. Why? Because the social pressure is very important there. And if, if people really uh, uh, realize that uh, the women's rights have to be recognized and the, the social uh, kind of uh, supporting system is provided, then the change will come from the villages. Uh, but in the cities, it's difficult. Why? Because cities are more individualistic. Uh, this is what I, I think, that cities are more individualistic and people in general do not care much. I mean, it's easier to come out on the streets and sort of give them a demonstrations, but for the attitudinal change and uh, and providing the supporting system from the grassroots within the family itself is difficult. So people in general do not care much about others. Therefore, change in the status of women is slow. So in my view, the change in the, uh, in the cities is much slower than the villages. This, uh, this cultural difference resulted in a paradoxical situation rooted in new European ideas of rationalism and progress uh, as we were talking about uh, using liberty and, uh, uh, and dignity and that sort of thing. So this is actually coming from the rationalist uh, uh, modern uh, European ideas. The reformers tried to create a new society in India. Uh, reformers, we have talked about some of them and there are many of them. Modern yet rooted in Indian traditions. So all of them, they tried to develop this uh, modernity of, within India. That was modern, yet it has to be rooted in Indian tradition. They began a critical appraisal of Indian society in an attempt to create a new ethos, devoid of all overt social aberrations like polytheism, polygamy, casteism, sati, child marriage, illiteracy, all of which they believed were Im impediment of, to progress of women. All the social reforms shaped a belief common to many parts of the world in the 19th century that no society would progress if the women were left behind. So women have to be taken together. So this was the basic idea. And therefore, uh, in Europe and uh, in the rest of the world, everywhere uh, from 19th century, uh, people realized that they have to be taken together. So to the reformers, the, party, uh, the, the position of Indian women, as it was in the 19th century, was similarly low and hence their efforts were directed at the overall improvement in the status of women through uh, legislation. So 
uh, in the beginning, you know, uh, through the legislation, things were trying, uh, they were uh, made better, political actions and propagations of education, etc. Now, uh, let me also talk a little bit about uh, uh, what women rights are and what is their concern. Women, modern thinkers seem to concern with mainly four ways of looking at women rights. For example, uh, rights as liberties, rights as claims, rights as entitlement, and rights as trumps. So basically we can look at, I mean, the four basic ways of looking at the rights. Rights as liberties, we have, we have talked about rights as claims, rights as entitlement, and rights as trumps. When in conflict, uh, negotiate to reduce the tension, uh, but then not as absolute. That means not not really going for antagonism, but uh, reducing the tension. And they have been integrally related with the discourse on duties and discourse on rights. These are two discourses as we have, we have been talking about, and not only comparable, but also to a certain extent convertible. So uh, duty discourse and right discourse, they are uh, to a certain extent con convertible. And therefore we have been talking about within Indian tradition, how modern thinkers try to incorporate uh, the duty, uh, the right dis uh, human rights discourse within the duty discourse. Uh, rights are claims against others, uh, which means that when somebody is saying that it is my right, is that it's a right against somebody. That if I'm saying that it's my right to uh, get my degree, which means that uh, I'm claiming this against my institution where I'm studying. Uh, so rights are actually the claims against others and these others could be individuals or it could be state or it could be group. So uh, at different levels we can these are, rights are as claims. Whereas the obligations of human beings pertain both to the man as such an obligation as we have been talking about obligations towards humanity uh, or obligation towards oneself or obligation could be towards others. So uh, thus duties discourse theoretically provides a broader, broader ways and goal for human development. And if we are talking about humanity, then of course it's the widest uh, framework we are talking about. Uh, but, does it, but, but does it make any sense in the real life of the women? So you, again, I'm coming back to the same question that theoretically the duty discourse is one of the widest perspective. But does it really make a difference in the real life of the women? Now, uh, if I think I have, I can take another ten minutes to uh, discuss uh, the the history of uh, uh, women rights movement. Uh, women rights movement in India, actually, uh, as we can uh, can be distinguished uh, or which, which can be seen as different phases. Uh, before and during independence movement, women par participated in large number. And as we all know that uh, uh, women were actually playing a very important role because I mean, for independence, uh, it was needed. It was a need of the hour that half of the population cannot be left, left behind. So independence movement, women participated in large numbers, but their participation was in a subordination and they were playing the role of subordination but not leadership by sheer contextual necessity these movements can hardly be considered as women rights movements so they cannot be considered as women right because after all they were subordinate they're playing the role of a subordination it is only around 1970s that gender was recognized as a category and was asserted feminism was seen as a tool for transcending sphere of knowledge production, feminism as critical perspective to various disciplines was added. It took form of an academic movement in 1970, as well as political movement. As a result, greater inclusion of women and women experiences in every inquiry was felt. So it was only in 1970 that we can see a, a, a total kind of change in the perspective towards women. So women got engaged in transforming every branch of knowledge by using gender as a category of understanding, examining the relation 
of theory to political questions and argued that there is a close relationship between theory and politics. Women rights are recognized as human rights during the World Conference on Human Rights held in Vienna, 1993. So it is actually the Vienna uh, uh, Conference, as, as we call it, uh, that declared the full and equal participation of women in civil, political, economic, social, and cultural life at the national, regional, and international level, and the eradication of all forms of discrimination on grounds of sex as priority objectives of the international community. Indian constitution also prohibits any discrimination on grounds of religion, race, caste, sex, or place of birth. The convention on the uh, elimination of all forms of discrimination against women, which was in 1976, as it is called CED, CEDA, acknowledges that discrimination against women violates the principle of equality or rights and respect of human dignity and is an obstacle to the participation of women in spirit of the Western concept of liberal uh, 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 women, uh, of equal terms with men in the political, social, economic and cultural life of their countries. Now this in turn affects the development of family and society as a whole. This convention has been ratified by India and utilized by Indian judiciary in order to direct the state to take action. So actually these as you can see are the implementation of all these uh, these uh, conventions and they, they have been adopted by India and they have been put to action. There has been much more original uh, organized movement recently based on demands for human, women rights such as the right of a girl child to school education, the right to food we are all familiar with, the entitlement of basic health care, guarantees of environment pre pre preservation and the right to employment guarantee. They also provide a politically harder edge to socially important demands. But during 1980 and 90s, one can notice significant change in political questions. Uh, we are all familiar with Mandal Commission recommendations that took place and then Babri Masjid uh, temple mask debates and free bank policies are implemented. The issue of caste, religion and economic liberalization starting creating new problems and context a reconfigured hegemonic culture when the knower and the known were both families forcing families to reintrospect into immediate world. Uh, so none of these people actually, they, they actually uh, were concerned about the, the new women, the new Indian women, which actually are the product of all this process of human uh, women rights. Uh, there are serious concern and dissatisfaction with the Hinduism becoming hegemonic and the discourse of new Indian women, a new hegemonic subject. Now, uh, I wouldn't really have much time to go into this concept of new Indian women, but uh, uh, this concept of new Indian women actually is much more westernized in look. Women dressed in the Western code and uh, sort of uh, living the life uh, of a Western world uh, with the contradictory uh, kind of uh, uh, social uh, norms of the society, Indian society. Uh, nothing changed in the mind, but only the look uh, of the women has changed. The girls, I mean, you 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 find women in the metro, the metro cities uh, walking on the street or in the metro. You find them as if you're walking, uh, you are seeing these girls in the New York. But if you talk to them and if you uh, try to find out the family structure and their, their life, nothing has changed. So this is the concept of new Indian women. So this is a new hegemonic subject. The shift in family's issues is perceptible as the issues of gender and development, which were primarily economic issues, started becoming the social issues as well. Women are treated by the state as self-sacrificing and political centers of family taking back to their uh, traditional roles within the family's agenda. 
So uh, women actually are taking the, the, the traditional roles more uh, in last one decade or so we can find women were empowered to act as agents within the development agenda of the state. So they're taking part in the development agenda at the same time they are more traditional now. Women uh, and, the, and in the name of women empowerment for feminism. Women's movement as empowerment programs have also been able to achieve to a certain extent an intellectual, institutional, and political transformation perceived by the founders of women's study centers in education systems in India during this decade. So we find this paradoxical situation. On the one hand, we find some changes, but at the same time, not much change has uh, taken place. So if we look at the women's struggle in India during the last three decades, we notice that we have uh, we have come a long way and the divisive uh, glo globalization factor within the women's rights movement have added a new dimension. The new Indian women is the result of the complexities we face so today in India. But perhaps we need to ask some of the fundamental questions such as are, the, are there two distinct categories such as Western feminism and Indian feminism? No doubt, the differences and complexities exist in both the traditions, whether it is Indian or it is Western. Still, the question always remains, how Western is the Western feminism? Because Western is not a, a unified kind of tradition. There's so much within the Western feminism. So the question is, how Western is the Western feminism? The category of the Western feminism itself is not uh, is, is not a homogeneous category. Yet, the category of Indian feminism has an inbuilt paradox. So as to how much Indian feminism be based on Indian values of self-sacrifice, caregiver, surrender, supportive, submissive, cooperative, traditional and culture-based and how much it would be within the coming, within the uh, spirit of the Western concept of liberal, democratic, right, justice, and equality based. How does an Indian woman balance the two? So as to keep her identity as an Indian woman. I mean, Indian women, if a woman, if she wants to keep the identity, then it has to be Indian. And if it is Indian, then it has to be self-sacrificing, caregiving, surrendering, supportive, etc. So, the question of right and uh, liberty and choosing, that does not arise much. So the question is, how does an Indian woman balance the two as to keep her identity as an Indian woman rooted in her values, can fight for her legitimate rights? Now, the only uh, 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 way out seems to be that Indian women, if at all it makes any sense, must have a balance of the two, a tight rope. That means duty-based and right-based, as we were saying, the two, two approaches. So Indian women, to conclude, I would say, Indian women, if at all it makes sense, must have a balance of the two, that is a tight rope walk. Balancing and facing often the danger of being stamped, either of propagating Hindutva. So if you are tradition, if you are following the tradition, then it will be a kind of, propagating Hindutva or if you're not following that, if you are more towards the right waste, then you'll be stamped as Western women to be rejected straight away within Indian society. So one has to balance between the two. Neither are propagating, propagating Hindutva nor, propagating, uh, nor becoming Western women. So the issues of oppression gender biases and discrimination are neither Indian nor Western. So this is exactly what I'm trying to draw your attention, that the issues are neither Indian nor Western. They are issues related to humanity based on morality. So the foundation actually is morality and humanity, dignity, human respect. If women are recognized as human beings, having equal opportunities and equal choices, then one has to realize that the way the girl child is treated in a family in India has to be changed. It cannot remain the, the traditional way of treating the child. She needs much more dignified treatment, not only after birth, 
but also before she's born. We all are familiar how the girl child is, is actually the feticide takes place. The moment uh, and the mother participated, that is the most unfortunate part of it. So this must change that more women, women in the girl child, even before she's born, she has to be treated as with, with much more dignity and respect. Thank you so much.